What's, in what's interesting about it, this story, is that um, it only works because they were in the same house, that they were able to be there in the same house. So I, I guess for some, you know, in, in some ways, we, we will say, you know, they, um, maybe they were married to the same guy. I don't remember how, I don't remember how it was presented to me as a kid when I first read that story or somebody told me that story, but I'm pretty sure it was presented to me that they weren't prostitutes, mainly because we don't want to have kids probably asking their Sunday school teachers, what's a prostitute? That's not usually where you want to have the first discussion of prostitution go on. Um, I know I read this. I know I heard the story when I was a kid. I 100% knew this good. The Solomon story? Not really. I don't know. I remember. I, all I remember was reading legends about David and Solomon. And, and there are like kids books that were the legends. Yes. I had one. Legends of David and Solomon, which were basically the Midrashim. But this story is not a midrash. This story is right from the Torah. And it's really a good example of how, um, you know, of how the Bible talks about prostitution fairly matter-of-factly. And um, you know, the way that this is presented, it doesn't seem that odd that this type of decision would be coming before a king and um I, i'm only thinking about this because in a week or so we read the haftorah we read the haftorah of jephthah the story that we've read before we actually read it not too long ago the story in judges of of jephthah who becomes this great general leader for the for the israelites against the ammonites and it says in the first line that he's the son of a prostitute um, and he's not well liked by his brothers. Well, it, I mean, it's there. I, I guess we just kind of de-emphasize that part of it. But the way the Bible speaks about it, it it's so matter of fact that that um, I think it's surprising to us because you know we we have these ideas of of biblical morality, and the Bible doesn't seem to have look. The story is a sad story of these two women. One of them has a, a, a baby who's dead, but there doesn't seem to be a judgment anywhere in this story that the, the mothers are licentious or did anything to deserve this because of their station in life of their profession. There doesn't seem to be any of that. It seems to be just kind of told matter of factly. So I, I do find it interesting. Again, specifically, probably maybe especially now, thinking about you know discussions about sexuality and and um, and uh, pregnancy today is is I think we'd be surprised at how the Bible actually um, presents these things. And of course, what's famous about the story is that Solomon essentially tricks the the mothers into exposing who's the real mother. And as we mentioned last week, the story really only works if we believe that Solomon can indeed cut a baby in two. If, if, the, if the mothers don't think he can do it, there's no fear that he's going to do it. And then there's no reason for them to, um, there's no reason for them to react. One reacting by saying, yeah, go ahead and cut it. And the other one saying, no, just give her the baby. It only works if you think he can do it, which again, begs the question, what did people expect their kings to do in the ancient world? I guess Solomon is no different than any other king who, who could ha hold matters of life and death in his hands. And I thought about this because it's, there's no, you can't justify this along the Torah, right? He's not, he's not using the Torah to, to, um, to, ju to judge this case. He's using uh, his, his, he's using his mind. He's being clever in how he's, how he's doing this, exposing the truth. But he's not following the Torah by saying, yeah, we can, yeah, I have the authority to cut a baby in two. It just, it just occurred to me, would you actually give your child to someone who is willing to see it cut in two? Oh, the carrot's growing. 
Well, in, in that story, I mean, he was, he was kind of playing chicken, right? I mean, right. we don't know. But was the purpose of the story to show that he really was so clever and, you know, he deserved right. to so, and Obviously, the purpose of the story is to show that he is wise and then... Yeah, yeah that's the but these right? that's the punchline. Was the last really line anything? we heard was, when all Israel heard the decision that the king had rendered, they stood in awe of the king for they saw that he possessed divine wisdom to execute justice. And La Asot Mishpat means to do justice, but in this case, execute justice is, a, is an interesting translation. And we said, what was the translation in the King James, Mary? Uh, end of chapter three. To do judgment. But as Mary stressed, it says in fear of the king, right? Because the word um, the word that we have here is yira'u, yira, which means to have fear or awe. They translated it as awe, which is they're amazed and they're in wonder at him. But there is this sense that, oh, no, they definitely feared that Solomon could kill somebody. Uh, again, co completely contrary to the Torah, but again, the threat of, the, of this happening worked. Like if one of the mothers had in the back of their mind said, there's no way Solomon can cut this baby in two because it goes against the Torah, they wouldn't have been scared of it. You can't go into court and do this today, right? You can't go into a court of the United States and say, fine, we'll just cut this baby in two. People would say, no, you can't do that. On the other hand, we do expect our rulers even our democratically elected rulers to kill people. We don't want to know about it, but we give them tremendous latitude, Democrats and Republicans, to execute people <laughs> extrajudiciously, to basically have a meeting and say, here's who we're going to kill in a drone strike. And we're pretty good with that. As a matter of fact, the idea of killing somebody with a drone with a drone strike is a whole lot more palatable than saying we're going to send in American soldiers to risk their lives and maybe be killed taking somebody out. So I would say we definitely wouldn't be okay with a, 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 a governor or a president or any other elected official threatening to chop a baby in two. However, we would say in some cases, especially when national security is on the line, that we're okay with this. Um, and and, and in, in reality, we re we'd rather not know about it. Isn't there a possibility that this could just be sort of like a, a sort of a chess game here? And Solomon knows, okay, you know, I'm making this move and I think this is going to work. But what happens if they... You know, they think, you know, it doesn't work. And doesn't he have a, because I can't just imagine says, okay, well, let's just cut the baby in half. That didn't quite go the way I thought it would. I just don't, can't imagine that happening. But well, maybe look, just, the, the, pra, the, yeah. the fact is, Don, the, the last parts of the Bible that we just read in yeah, chapter two and three was yeah. that he's killing people that his dad told him to kill. And he decides, hey, including his brother, Adonia, kill him. <laughs> And kill yeah. him in the temple, not the temple yet, the tabernacle. Kill him on the on the holy, holy, the holy altar. You kill him. He sends the island to kill him. The pump and make sure you know there weren't any possible contenders. Uh, here, it's just everybody. Know, look, yeah. everybody would say, "Yeah, that's what been. kings do." Yeah. But the fact that he, we just read about him killing people means that Solomon definitely has let people know that he means business yeah. including killing people and here again it only works if we think that there is a maybe a chance that he's gonna kill a baby i don't know I keep seeing the judge judy hat on in this some of the great some of the great jewish judges of all time i officiated a funeral by the way on thursday for a very long-serving judge in uh, in the LA Superior Court last week, Judge uh, Mike Luros, who was uh, from the Valley and served on the court for a long time, and at the service were several um, several judges were there, 
uh, including, and I thought about judges when they become like a level of, of being well known and Judge Ito was there. And it was like, you're like, oh yeah, these they're, sometimes judges get to be well known. It's not usually in their wheelhouse to be famous, but we have been talking a lot about judges lately. We've been knowing about judges a whole lot. And it's interesting because it does seem like that's a big part of what being king was in these days. We read about, we read about you know, Absalom putting himself out and, tell, and telling everybody that he's, you know, he's, he, he's going to hear their cases. It seems like judging was a big part, adjudicating, rendering decisions was a big part of what kings did. It doesn't seem like it would be their thing. Moses definitely does that, right? And it's one of the things that he's kind of given that role, like in the in the in the biblical mindset, Moses is the political leader. We would say he's also kind of the the religious leader, but we know that Aaron, his brother, is the priest, right? He's not the religious leader who offers sacrifices, but he's more of the teacher, right? The more of teacher. Yitro te exactly. Yitro tells him, "You're not gonna." You can't, you're going to burn out. You can't keep rendering all the judgment by yourself. So there does seem to have been this level of, of judging cases. Now, is, is this a mythological level thing? Maybe, but the, the story is put out there as a definitive example of Solomon's wisdom. We're going to read some more. And this is, um, this is, uh, the kind of, we, I would say we really only get a bird's eye view of Solomon. We don't really get to know him the way we know David. And um, he's too busy having a thousand wives. <laughs> a thousand wives kept him busy. He definitely seems to have not had as much to do uh, internationally or like, you know, with his foreign policy, because things seem to be pretty s stable during his time. Well, we have different scribes. Different scribes than his, than his father, yep. But no matter what, somebody decided to keep David's records and tell his tale in a way that we really get, a, you know, a one-on-one -on -one view of it, you know, where we're having discussions and close-ups, if you will. We get a close-up or two. In Solomon, it's almost always almost like a really pulled out kind of view of what's happening. And we don't, we don't, you know, we get, we get quick shots, but we don't get long discussions. So here, chapter four is where we're going to begin with a, with a introduction, again, a reintroduction to who Solomon's uh, courtiers are, his inner circle. We've already read a little bit about it, but we're going to read a little bit more. King Solomon was now king over all Israel. These were his officials. Azariah, son of Zadok, the priest, Elihoreth and Ahiah, sons of Shisa, scribes, Jehoshaphat, son of Ahihud, recorder, Benaiah, son of Yehoada, over the army, Zadok and Abiadar, priests, Azariah, son of Natan, in charge of the prefects, Zavud, son of Natan, the priest, companion of the king, Ahishar, in charge of the palace, and Adoniram, son of Abda, in charge of the forced labor. Yeah. So this is his inner circle. And we see some names that we've heard before. We've heard about Sadok, the priest. He kicks out Abiatar, who was backing Adoniah and was part of the inner circle of David, but was on the wrong side, at least as far as Solomon was, was concerned. We also heard about Nathan, the prophet, it seems like his son got into the inner circle, Azariah, Azariahu, well, this is the son of Nathan. Now, there's also a Nathan the priest. It says there's a Nathan who's a priest. It's a different Nathan. But it says that there's a Kohen, there's a priest named Nathan, and he's a companion. He's part of the inner circle, too. So you definitely see some priests in the inner circle here, which is maybe one of the reasons why Solomon will be so, in, so concerned about building the temple is because... He does, he has surrounded himself with lots of priests. You also, we also see that he has this interesting um, uh, person, uh, Adoni Ram. I only say it's, he's interesting because he's in charge of forced labor. What the hell is that? 
right? That is a very unusual thing to see. And it should be an unusual thing to see because we only find two people in the Bible ever having forced labor. The word is, is mas. But we know there was we know there were slaves, but this doesn't seem to be slaves. It's a different word. It's a different word. And the this only is like time... a, a conscript labor force. Yeah. And so guess where the only other time we see this word? Pharaoh? Yes. There's only two people in the entire Bible who have this thing, forced labor. Could they be criminals? Uh, could be, but the, the context for Egypt was us. Right. <laughs> with us. And now Solomon has the same thing. So look, you know, the theory, uh, at least of uh, we don't really know what this means other than somebody did not, th this is not slavery. Could it be, could it be prisoners? Perhaps, but we never have heard of this before. We've never heard of prisoner, a prisoner labor force that was, um, uh, call this. What is the King James calling it? <laughs> the, King, the, the King James has a much better translation. King James has tribute. And so the King James knew that the context of this, and again, probably the linguistic similarities to other words in, in Arabic and, and Semitic languages, mean that this, this is not slavery. Tribute is has more of a context of a willingness to do this or more of a tax, right? Maybe not a willingness, but definitely doesn't seem to be, um, uh, it doesn't seem to be, a, well, it might be a punishment if you're, if you feel like it's a punishment, but it also could be the fact that it is a tax of your labor, which we know the Egyptians, or we believe the Egyptians also had based on the archeological evidence we have, that Egypt maintained a workforce of their citizens, which they, during rotations, had to go to build construction projects, whether they were pyramids or whether they were, whether they were, um, you know, like the Bible says we built, which were cities like Pitom and Ramses for the Egyptians. There seems to have been at least in Egypt, and maybe again here in Israel, based on what we're reading, a national labor corps pool of labor that was actually, people had to go up for a month, maybe a year, and do work. And probably, again, building projects. Look, we, the reason, one of the reasons we felt the Egyptians probably had this, and then we found evidence for it in some of the archaeology that's been done in the last 20 or 30, 30 years, we, we were like, how do they build the pyramids and some of these other great building projects with just, with only slave labor? Because how do they maintain that many slaves? And so what we kind of discovered was based on the accommodations that, that these people, where they lived, is they don't seem to be permanent labor areas and they don't seem to have been treated as slaves. How does this work? I mean, people people get conscripted. They get they do reserve duty. Remember, Israel has miluim. They have they have reserves in the army. Every Israeli has to go and 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 they do they do military service until they're about fifty. It's not as big of a deal as it used to be because Israel is not on constant you know threat of being invaded anymore. But the Miluin, the reserves were a major, that was a major issue during the wars in the 70s and 80s of, of what, at what level did the, did the Israeli army call up their reserves? So this idea of having reserves, of having uh, conscripts in the military, uh, if everyone's in the military and everyone's a reservist, that means everybody in the country is participating in this. I would also tell you, you know, we have, we have that day once a year that people say is your day of being free of taxes. If you pay 30% or something of your taxes, well, I forget what they call it, but right. tax, tax freedom day. What do they call it? Tax freedom day. Tax freedom day. So yeah, if you, if you compute how much of your, of your work that you spend towards paying your taxes, 
it's not, it's not far-fetched for us to say, hey, look, if you had to give one month a year to the government to work, and you'd be like, well, what do I know about building a, you know, what do I know about construction? What do I know about building things? Well, probably not the greatest labor force, but if you have massive building projects that you need to have people working on, it's labor intensive, you really don't have a choice. And I would tell you, based on how much we pay in taxes, working one month a year, as opposed to three months a year, if you're giving 30% of your, of your work towards um, government, really ain't so bad. Most of us, if we, got, if we, if we were told we we're going to pay 10% flat tax rate, most of us would jump on that. We'd go, are you kidding me? So if somebody told you you had to work a month a year to pay and then the rest, and then the rest of the year you got to keep your money, people would love that. So I will just put out there, it's not far-fetched that that was the way people saw their service to their national, to, the, to their, their government. I will only tell you, it only exists two places in the Bible, the Egyptians and the Israelites, the only times we ever see these words in, these, in this context of Solomon. I will tell you, it doesn't seem to go over well, though, with the Israelites, as we're about to see. Not today, but we will see it soon. This thing did not, do, did not sit well with Israelites. So now, let's continue with what Solomon had in his, in his retinue. Solomon had 12 prefects governing all Israel who provided food for the king and his household. Each had to provide food for one month in the year. And these were their names, Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim. Yes, and that is where we get Ben-Hur. Now, again, in the, in the movie from yes, the book, Ben-Hur, this is a name. Um, what's interesting about it is... Ben-Hur is usually the last name, right? The son of Hur. Right. So did this guy have a name that dropped out? You know, uh, one of the guys was named Ben-Hur because this is a really strange fact that we have this um, name that doesn't, you know, that doesn't, uh, that what isn't really attached. Plus it also is, it says, from, from the hill country of Ephraim, rather than saying, from the tribe, because what we're seeing is, is these are not tribal designations necessarily, but they're more based on what Solomon creates, which are regional designations for the country that are not necessarily based on the tribal areas, but of regions. So it would be like if we said, just to use this as an example, that we said, this is from the Midwest. Well, it could be Minnesota, it could be Ohio, it could be you're like, where is it? It could be any of those places. Or if we're going to say it's the Appalachians, the Appalachian region or the Smoky Mountain regions, because they just gave us a mount of the hill country of Ephraim. But is that really just the tribe of Ephraim? You'll see here too. Bendekar in Makats, Shalvim, Bet Shemesh, and Elon Bet Hanan, Ben Chesed in Arabot. He governed Saho and all the Hefer area. And you see, everybody has a Ben Chesed, Ben Deker. There, th this is not uh, this is not just Ben Hur, but again, uh, I forgot who write I forgot who write uh, Ben Hur, but in the story, his name is Judah Ben Hur. Uh, not Charlton. Not yeah, Charlton Heston. Um, ben Hur, <laughs> but. Uh, yes, normally, again, we would have a, fr a first name and the son of so-and-so, and based on what tribe they're at. And these are cities. These are not, these are regions. These are not the tribes. Oh, Beth Shemesh is the place. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Beth Shemesh is the place. And it's still there. I mean, there's still a I mean, there's still a place called Beth Shemesh, which is not far from, not far from um, uh, Jerusalem, and it means the house of the sun. We read about it in um, in the Samson stories. It was one of the places where the Philistines and the Israelites would would, would meet in battle. All right, we'll keep going. Ben Adav, Abinadab, in all of Nafat Dor, Solomon's daughter Tafat, was his wife. 
Banas and of Alihud in Tanakh and Megiddo and Abeshain, which is in which is beside Zaretan below Jezreel, from Bethshain to Abel Mechola, as far as the other side of Yokmeam, Ben Gever in Ramot Gilead, he governed the villages of Jair, son of Manasseh, which are in Gilead, and he also governed the district of Argo, which is in Bashan, 60 large towns with walls and bronze bars. Ahinadav, son of Ido in Mahanaim, Ahimaat in Naphtali, he too took a daughter of Solomon, Basimat, to wife. Baana, son of Hushi in Asher and Baalot, Yehoshaphat, son of Parua in Issachar, Shimei, son of Elah in Benjamin, Geber, son of Uri in the region of Gilead, the country of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and one prefect who was in the land. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sands of the sea. They ate and drank and were content. Yeah, except as we just read, Solomon really doesn't differentiate or govern his country by the tribes. He didn't. I mean, you saw some. You saw Benjamin. You saw Issachar. You saw some of them. You saw Naphtali. Those were those were regions that were tribal regions that may, they maintain their name. But for the most part, three quarters of the regions are not named after their tribe anymore. A Gilad. You know, even with Gilad, it's it's in the hill country. There, they're still referring to the eastern part of of Israel, the part in modern day Jordan, as they called it, the country of Sihon and Og. They're still calling it that, going all the way back to Numbers, recognizing that this was not part of the original promised land. So Israel, you know, is has been divided up. And what's interesting is is that when we get to this kicker here, is that is that um. Is, and this is the end of the chapter. Um, he really, he's, he's redrawn the map. Solomon has basically redrawn the map. Correct. Well, correct. So Judah and Israel are still separated, which we would kind of say is the northern tribes versus Judah. There's a differentiation between his people, the Judites, Solomon's people, and the northern tribes, the ones that King Saul represented and, and his family and some of those other people represented um, the north. And we're going to see that play out later. But Judah and Israel are still almost treated as two separate entities, two separate political entities. But what Solomon has done is essentially redrawn the map, not along tribal lines, but along his regional lines that he's going to um, rule by. And what's interesting about that, of course, is what he, what he does by doing that is he essentially is obliterating the tribal power. Because it, if the tribes no longer have, for the most part, boundaries that are based on their tribes, he's basically saying, I don't care what tribe you're from. You're from that part of the country. You're from that part of the country. And, mm -hmm. and it literally is redrawing the political, not just the, the map, but you're redrawing your political power. You're literally redistricting or gerrymandering your country so that you don't have to worry about one tribe or the tribes banding together and being a problem for you. So it's a really smart thing for Solomon to do, but what it's doing is essentially obliterating what's existed up until that period. And we don't know for how long, by the way, but if we're going to say it goes all the way back, or at least the concept of tribes, goes all the way back to Jacob, Solomon's just rewritten that. And I don't think most of us think about Solomon in those terms, but what he really did was uh, revolutionary, but also probably very incendiary, which is to tell tribes, I don't care where your, where your tribal boundaries are. That doesn't mean anything to me. So again, it would literally be like, to use the analogy, it would literally be like people saying, well, we still have 50 states, but we're going to redraw the map and we're going to take, you know, we're going to take, you know, for example, I'm just saying we, we're going to take West Texas and put it with New Mexico 
and then the rest of Texas, we're still going to have a Texas, or we're going to call it something different, but it's going to, it's going to um, represent a Texas that doesn't have West Texas as part of it. Because if they looked at the map and said, oh, well, that's where Beto O'Rourke is from, and we don't want him part of Texas anymore, you know, because we'll, we might as well just put all those guys together with the people in, in New Mexico. I mean, I, I'm not saying this is going to happen. I, I'm just saying you could understand people wanting that to happen. Because remember, when people gerrymander and, and when they redistrict, they know what they're doing. They, they know they know the districts that they're creating. And in some cases, they'll say, look, we'll, we'll let them have a district. We'll let the other party have a district. But we want to have more of our districts. We want to guarantee that our that we have a numerical uh, a differentiation in our area. And, and, and the other party, let's say, even if they're a majority party, they'll concede it. I had a discussion yesterday with, with Scott with Scott Wilk about how the, how our area is being redrawn up, and our and his Senate seat, the Senate seat that he that he has right now, is about to shift two more points, uh, two percentage points, which means your district, mostly if you're in Santa Clarita, is about to go two two points more towards the Republicans because essentially the Democrats of California said we don't care what Santa Clarita does, we're, we're going to concede it. And so, you know, it, it creates a safer seat for the Republicans, but it also, um, it, it's also, again, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a political, it's a pro political concession that people make. Well, so what? Give them one seat, but we create two safer seats for us. So this is done all the time. And again, it's not fair because you go, hey, sometimes the district lines don't make any sense at all because they carve out areas and, and you know, that you look at the lines, you know, that's ridiculous. You created this just so you could create an ethnic block for one, for one representative, but people do it all the time. It's done, it's done all the time. And what's crazy about it is it doesn't help the community, right? Because if the community essentially a line goes through the community and you're like, well, if we were all one district, we could get more done too bad. So it happens. It happens in our own day. It hasn't happened on a national level, but I don't know that it's, I mean, I don't think it'll, I don't think, I think most people have enough of their state pride that they wouldn't want to see that happen, but you never know. You never know. In light of recent events, don't be so shocked if people are willing to have their states redrawn. So <laughs> I would have said such a thing would not have been conceivable, but it's not inconceivable anymore. Uh, especially if things are thrown back to more uh, to the states having more uh, power, maybe some people will be okay with it on both sides of the aisle. Anyways, that's what Solomon did. He redrew the map of Israel, but there's still a Judah and there's still an Israel, so there's still two powers. And the good news is, they ate and drank and were content. <laughs> they were happy. What, what's the King James have for smechim? What's the what's the last word? They were they were content or they were making merry. That's that's even a better translation, right? Because sameach means to be joyous. Content seems to mean eh, I had a good meal in myself in my belly. I can lay back down and I feel good. But sameach means to literally be happy, like simchat Torah. Sameach means happy, joyous. So uh, that is Yismechu, right? And we say in Shabbos, Yismechu uh, They were happy, more than content. Yes, it seems like they eat, drink, and were merry. That's that is the end of chapter four. It seems with Mary. That's right. Well, she's they're not drinking, so so that is chapter four. Pretty much a straightforward business thing. I mean, that's twenty-one chapters. Not a lot of text, not a lot of narrative here. Uh, that's, one of the, that's one of the few chapters we get about Solomon. Let's read this one. Solomon's rule extended over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and the boundary of Egypt. They brought Solomon tribute and were subject to him all his life. Solomon's daily provisions consisted of 30 cores of semolina and 60 cores of ordinary flour, 10 fattened oxen. 20 pasture fed oxen, and 100 sheep and goats, besides deer and gazelles, 
roebuck, and fatted geese. Yeah. Now, this is not what Solomon personally ate every day. This was not, this is the court. This was not what he was eating. But it was telling us that his court on a daily gazelles basis kosher? was going through all this Are stuff. gazelles yeah, so kosher? It's interesting. Sure they are, I think. Everything you're reading yep. here is kosher. The, the, the issue is they're not usually animals that we think of as being slaughtered in a kosher way because usually deer and gazelle and roebuck which are all kind of deer type animals. We don't like they're venison, right? We don't think of them because we normally hunt them. They normally are hunted, right? With a bow and arrow or with a gun or something like that, right? That's the way we, but if you kill, if you show, if you kill a, a, a gazelle or a deer with the kosher way of cutting its jugular vein, it's a hundred percent kosher. You just don't find it a lot, but you can find kosher venison usually in more expensive kosher restaurants, but you can find it. So all of these are kosher animals. Um, I, I don't know that deer and gazelle and roebuck would be my, my favorite translations for these things, but they definitely are the types of animals that you wouldn't normally eat. They're, they're, they're definitely on the high end of the spectrum for what people would consider to be animals we normally ate because you know, you you didn't have oxen a lot, but you you you, you would um, um, sheep and goats, all animals that you would normally see around a dinner table. But again, the deer, gazelle, roebuck, and then the fatted geese. I'm curious. Again, this is going to tell us that this is a not quite sure if this is the foie that we're normally accustomed to at a very high-end restaurant. But what is the translation that King James has for, for chapter three? I mean, for verse three, sorry. What's the Mary, what does that say? Uh, oh yeah, interesting, right? Yes, in some, in some versions of the Bible, some versions of the Bible, they are divided. It's not a Jewish thing. This is actually a Catholic versus uh, Protestant uh, number or ordering. Uh, namely because chapter four seems very short and this part definitely seems like it could have gone with the previous one but what is what is the uh what's the yeah fatted fowl for geese um but again there seems to be this um uh idea that this is not yeah normal kinds of fowl that, that were eaten uh but yeah the the translation that we used for for the deer heart which is that's deer um it's, it's, they're all kinds of deer uh, or or wild ruminants that you know that you would normally see hunted even in those days but they raised them because he could you know, and, and he had that ability. Uh, again, these are enormous amounts of, of grain per day. You know, it can make loaves and loaves of bread. Uh, semolina is, is a grain. We use it for, uh, for pasta. A lot of pasta uses semolina wheat. Yeah, these are, these are high-end grains. Ordinary flour is kind of like they're saying that's the kemach, that's the, 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 the uh, just the flour. And then the word for... Um, I, they probably don't use semolina as the translation of the King James, does it, does it? Mary? Fine, fine, flour. fine flour, yeah. So they're basically saying there's a coarse flour and then there's a fine flour. And, you know, uh, they're both used for certain things. And, you know, um, we'd, we would say that they're, yeah, corn and flour. We would say there, there is, uh, yeah, there's a difference between the flour you, you would use for, for, for baking pastry and the, 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 the flour you use for breaking bread, baking bread. So this is giving us a, a, an idea of the level of wealth that Solomon's court enjoyed. So this was for daily preparations for his inner court. We don't read about these kind of uh, excesses. And again, it doesn't seem to be the, the job of the biblical author in David to talk about what David's court was like. Not so with Solomon. Solomon, they're going to give us some opulent 
descriptions of what this was like. Is this beyond reason? Absolutely not. It's definitely a lot, but it's not ridiculous. It's not at the level where this would be considered unbelievable. Uh, it's just a tremendous amount of food being consumed by, by the staff. Yeah, by the staff, which again includes all of his courtiers, anybody who, who's part of his inner circle, and again, the staff themselves, the staff that took care of, of him. So this is the operation, the daily operation. So it would be, again, if we looked at how much food was served in the House and Senate cafeteria versus just how much the president was eating in the White House. Uh, <laughs> correct, correct. So, so this, <laughs> we, would, we, would, we, would look, we would look at this as being a quite a, quite a, um, quite a spread, a daily spread. And um, there are animals probably weren't anywhere near as big as ours though. Probably not, you're right. Probably nowhere near as big. But there is this understanding, interestingly, that there is a difference between the fattened oxen and the pasture-fed oxen. So more of the oxen... Nowadays, you'd pay more for the grass-fed one. Correct, which is, which is the reverse of the way things used to be when we, when we became factory farmers. So they're basically saying, just like the flour, we had good flour and you know, high in flour and low, lower. So the, they had you know, Wagyu beef, and they also had the hamburger. And that's what they're basically saying that they had. And the, and the, in this case, of course, the fat and oxen were considered to be the, the ones that were- um, The luxury. Those are the ones, you know, the marbled. I don't know, why am I even talking about this? This is a vegetarian, <laughs> I find this to be completely offensive, this verse. But I will tell you that, again, it gives you some idea of the wealth of Solomon's court that they were able to enjoy these kinds of things. And again, what were they provided? We read who provided them. The people provided them. The, each, each, tr each region essentially had to provide, you know, every month for, for this, um, this, this stuff, which is another form of tax. Yeah, so in addition to the labor tax, they also had this cost, this administrative cost, which again, doesn't even get into what we're going to read, which was the expenses for infrastructure, which were there was an infrastructure here, which we're going to get to today. For he controlled the whole region west of the Euphrates, all the kings west of the Euphrates, from Tipsha to Gaza, and he had peace on all his borders round about. All the days of Solomon, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, dwelt in safety, every one under his own vine and under his own fig tree. Yeah, and there's that famous line that we get from the Bible, that everyone should dwell in peace under their own fine and under their own fig tree, which is what, of course, George Washington said to the Jewish community in, in uh, Rhode Island when he went to speak to the synagogue in Newport and said every, that everyone should be able to be, live in peace under their own vine and their own fig tree. So this was considered to be, you know, the greatest blessing is you dwell in safety. You don't have to worry. And again, everyone from Don to Beersheba, from the north to the south, again, the differentiation between Judah and Israel is still there. There is, as much as this is a unified kingdom, the kingdom is not the kingdom of Israel. It's not the kingdom of Judah. It's the kingdom of Judah and Israel. It's a unified kingdom of two parties that will not be unified for very long. They were not unified for very long, and they will not be unified for very long, but for this time they are. And they're, they're unified to some extent because, again, people are safe. They're not worried about uh, fighting from the outside. But I remember one of the things that always unified the Israelites, both from Judah and from Israel, was an exterior threat. When they were worried about exter external threats to them, they would oftentimes unify and they'll band together, which we will see later in the book of Kings happens, even after they separate. Occasionally, the kings of Judah and Israel will work together, but it's oftentimes because of the external threat, not the internal threat. There, there doesn't seem to be internal threats. There doesn't seem to be external threats. So, of course, this is eventually going to lead to people saying, why are we doing this? What do we need? What are we getting out of this? 
Uh, because again, if you live in peace, you don't think about military expenses. You don't want military expenses. You don't want to pay. You don't want to pay for a military if you don't need it. That's the irony, right? That's the trick. How do you get people to be unified when you're not worried about something? So it says he controlled the region of the Euphrates, right? Everything west to the, uh, this whole area from Syria down to, according to this, even Gaza, even the Philistines paid tribute. They all, all the kings basically paid tribute to Solomon. So Solomon was able to create this regional authority in the area. Very Difficult to say to what extent this happened, but whoever wrote this wants us to think or believe that it happened. And I, I would say this, based on what Solomon does and what he seems to be able to do, it seems like he, you know, what, whatever happened, he must have had peace. Now, it could also be it just he lived during a peaceful time when the greater powers, the Egyptians and the Assyrians and all these other powers were, were also at peace. And so that created a more stable situation for everybody in the region. He also always had problems with the Philistines. Though, right? Well, right now, the Philistines are definitely paying re respect to us. And, and probably, again, it doesn't say that Solomon drove them out. He, he, he lets them be there. He lets these kings stay in their places. But it says the kings in this area, you know, essentially re recognized him. And he was able to create that regional power. And what's important is, is Israel is able to function as what it all always is, which is the, the connecting point between Europe, Asia, and Africa. And because it is that land bridge between the continents, that it really has the ability to be a commercial hub. Israel is not a big country. It was never a big country, even during Solomon and David's time. It's not a big country, but it does have geography at its as, as a um, benefit to it. And again, a lot of people said, well, that's what Israel is going to have again in its new peace accords with the Arab countries around it, is it's going to become a regional powerhouse. It will happen to some extent, but nowadays, because so much of commerce is done over the internet, it really doesn't matter where you're located because it's not all about trade. It's not about, you know, goods and services and products traveling over your boundaries, which was, again, a way for Solomon to make money by taxing people, by bringing ships to his ports. They didn't need to do that. We don't need to do that anymore because you make money based on what kinds of companies you start. And the startup nation today is Israel, which has started these you know, companies like Waze and all these other internet companies that, you know, that we rely on now, but it doesn't really matter that, that the people are, are in Israel because they could be an Israeli working in Germany or working in New York. They don't have to be in Israel. So that's a real question. So would you consider like Israel that at that time like a trading post? Yeah. So Israel was a trading post. Israel was the place where, especially for land care, for a land caravan, for, for something going on along the Fertile Crescent, that this was the way to do it. Now, of course, you could, load, you could load stuff up on ships. Even if you came up through the Red Sea, you still had to come up probably through one of his ports, which we're going to read about. But whether, again, if the Philistines controlled Gaza and places along the coast, you still had the area around Haifa. You really had the, the northern coast of Israel all the way up to Lebanon was under Israel's control, under Solomon's control. And, and the bottom line is, people didn't want to put stuff out on the sea because it was so risky mm -hmm. that people wanted to use the land route. And if you are peaceful and you're maintaining peace, keeping raiders and bandits and other countries, rogue nations 
from attacking your stuff, everybody's fine with that. They like you and they'll pay it because if they know that their stuff is going to be safe, they'll pay a tax. They'll pay for that safety and security. And that's what he did. And that's what it says. He created a safe situation. And that is, of course, a testament to his name, which means Shlomo, the days of Solomon. But it's also Yemei Shlomo is also can be read as the days of peace. Oh, really? Good. Yeah. So this is a time when people were not worried about their stuff. Now, here's where we get to the infrastructure. <laughs> Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariotry and 12,000 horsemen. Now, All by the way, I will, I will say this. That seems like an enormous amount of horse uh, <laughs> chariots. I mean, this is just an enormous amount of an army. It would just be huge. So is this accurate? Is this true? There seems to be some elaboration on this based on, on um, the population. Now, this wasn't all in one place, but even saying that each tribe or each region now, as he had it, the states, the regions that he had, had a thousand horse uh, had a thousand horsemen and 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 each one would have essentially three thousand stalls for for chariots that's just a crazy amount of of chariots it just doesn't seem to be borne out by how many chariots could even exist in in that country they seem to be a little bit of of like more symbolic numbers but and again, we know that these numbers, 40 and 12, a lot of symbolic these are symbolic numbers. And look what happens. How do we come up with these numbers? All those prefects, each during his month, would furnish provisions for King Solomon and for all who were admitted to King Solomon's table. They did not fall short in anything. They would also, each in his turn, deliver barley and straw for the horses and the swift steeds to the palaces where the, to the places where they were stationed. Yeah. And so you can see that part of what you had to provide for, part of the infrastructure was taking care of the horses, right? And so whatever the cost was, however many there were, that was a huge cost for the people, was that they had to provide for these horses. Now, what's also very telling about this is the chariots and the horsemen harken back to the Philistines we read had chariots but of course what they really harken back to is Pharaoh because when we read about Pharaoh's chariots being thrown into the Red Sea in the very famous song of the sea where it talks about his riders his chariot riders and his his chariots being thrown into the sea that is such a captivating and powerful image and here we have Solomon with these amazing chariots and these horses. And this is a symbol of power. This is a symbol of military might. And again, taking care of these animals was a responsibility for each of those states when it was their turn. They had to provide for the horses, which would have been an enormous tax in itself. And again, they're telling you that this was a major part of, of what Solomon maintained. Here we go. God endowed Solomon with wisdom and discernment in great measure, with understanding as vast as the sands on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the Kedemites and than all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was the wisest of all men, wiser than Ethan the Ezraite and Heman Halhal and Darda the sons of Mahol. His fame spread among all the surrounding nations. Yeah, we don't know who any of those people are. We don't know who those guys are. I will say we do not know who Ezra, I mean, who Ethan the Ezraite is. We don't know who these people are. We have not read about them. We don't know who they are. We are not sure other than in the biblical period, 
And again, the Midrash doesn't like the fact we don't know who these people are, right? They, 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 they don't like this, right? Um, so as we look through these things, we're now getting another testament to Solomon's wisdom. What's interesting about the comparisons to the individuals who we really don't know who they are, we do compare him to the Babylonians and the Egyptians. What is the King James on that verse, Mary, for, the, for Solomon's wisdom is greater than the wisdom? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that is a very interesting translation for, and probably a good translation for the word Kedemite. There they just translate as B'nai Kedem as the Kedemites. Um, um, when you think about when you think about um, what they're saying here is a, rec is a recognition that you had wise people in the East and you had wise people in Egypt. You had these two centers of civilization and they were smart people. They were technologically advanced. They're where languages began where civilizations began around the Tigris Euphrates Valley, Samaria, Mesopotamia, and Egypt. And it's saying that Solomon is smarter than both of those sides. And so what you're really seeing is this idea that Israel had, which is they probably always felt very inferior to both the Egyptians and to the Babylonians, Assyrians. There's probably always this feeling like, dare I say it, that Israel was flyover country. Mm. But more, not so much the Midwest, because Israel didn't have, you know, fields of grain and all the kinds of support that, that the Midwest has from farming. But more, again, because we don't have anything quite like it in the United States, but places that are essentially there for commerce, for port cities, for places where people use it as a hub for travel, which are never considered to be like the places that people really want to stay at. They're just going from point A to point B. We don't have them so much anymore, but people did have them back when they traveled by train or they traveled by stagecoach is you had places that essentially existed as way stations. And we don't have them anymore. Um, but they had them in the ancient world. And, they, and we really had them in America for a certain period of time where there were places that essentially existed because they were, they were stops. They were stops on a, train, on a trail. And essentially, again, you know, we saw it when the freeway system started and cities became um, essentially, you know, cut off from Route 66, but people changed their travel and, and not only did they change the travel, but they started flying and they didn't need these cities to stop over in anymore. So that's more of what Israel saw, probably saw itself as. But here we have Solomon who rivals and again surpasses the Egyptians and the people of the East. But again, you see that even in, of course, in the Christian Bible with the, the wise men, the three, you know, the three, the three kings or the three wise men from the East, that the Babylonians were still considered to be very smart and had superior technology and information for a very long time. So Solomon is very wise, as we already have learned. And now we're going to get another specific example of his wisdom he composed 3000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1005 he discoursed about trees from the cedar in lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall 
and he discoursed about beasts, birds, creeping things, and fishes. So here's some specific things that Solomon did because he was so smart. He composed 3,000 proverbs, and he had songs that he wrote, 1,005. That's huge. It's a huge library of things that he composed. This is why we say, according to tradition, his father, we know, wrote songs, the Psalms of David. But we also have songs that he wrote, which we believe we have some of them, or tradition teaches us we have some of them, being the songs of Song of Songs. That he composed that Song of Songs. Now, the reality is Song of Songs, even if you pull out all the verses, it's only it's only a few chapters, right? It's all it's very short, it's a very short book of the Bible. Um, but uh if you did the verses, it's not going to come out to 1,005. But maybe that's just one example of the songs that he wrote. And then the Proverbs, uh, we don't have 3,000 Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, according to tradition, he wrote as well. There's actually another book that, according to tradition, he wrote, which is the book of Ecclesiastes, Kohelet. So all three of those books, Kohelet, Proverbs, and Song of Songs, according to tradition, he wrote. And the rabbis actually say that he wrote those at different stages of his life. They reflected Solomon in different places, in different stages. Song of Songs was a product of his youth, when he was in love, when he's writing songs to his thousand wives. So the fact that he'd have a thousand and five songs or sonnets or poems, shirim, can be poems or songs, is is uh yeah, he had one for each wife but uh but the the proverbs according to tradition he wrote when he was more of a of a of a young king of a middle-aged king they're a product of someone who has some wisdom but ecclesiastes interestingly the rabbis felt he wrote when he was older much older towards the end of his life looking back on his life and saying you know what what do you really, what's the real takeaway from this? And so they saw it as three stages, you know, as kind of his early days. As Seeger didn't write. Pete Seeger did not write. Yes, he <laughs> composed a nice melody to Ecclesiastes chapter three. But Ecclesiastes, as we're going to read in several months, is not an uplifting and happy book for, for the most part. It's a fairly uh, cynical, uh, and by cynical, I mean like Greek, cynic style approach to the world which is doesn't quite make sense all the time and it seems to be the product of somebody who has wisdom but also has had some life experience that has taught them that you know if there's a lot you're going to see in this life and so they like the idea that we do have some of solomon's books some of his works and none of those books by themselves we can date to Solomon or say they were written by Solomon. Um, almost, well, I can say almost. I would say virtually every biblical scholar feels that those books, with the, maybe the exception of Song of Songs, was written by many people and are compilations of things. Same thing, absolutely, with Psalms. A Psalms actually says that some of them were written by this person or some were written by that person. Yeah. So Psalms actually will say it. But this leads to where are these books? You know, the, this leads to Solomon composed these books. And even if we have some of them, the rabbis really want to account for all of them because they don't want to say that we lost any of Solomon's things. But it seems like there's no way we possibly could have all of these things. Or again, perhaps there's somewhat of an exaggeration about how much he wrote. Look. The next verse is where we get some of the biggest legend about Solomon, which is that when it says that he discoursed about trees, what's the King James say about that, Mary? He discoursed about trees. He spoke of trees. He spake of trees. Vaida bear al ha'itzim, min ha'erez, that he spoke of them. Uh, no. The Midrash says, quite frankly, he spoke to trees. And he spoke to he spoke to birds, and he spoke 
to insects and he spoke to fish. Yeah, he was like Dr. Doolittle, except not only did he speak to animals, but he could literally speak to anything and including demons and angels. And he had the power to communicate with these things. So what Solomon is able to do is use those skills, use the ability to communicate with these animals to accomplish some of the great feats that he does, including, as we're going to see, building the temple, but also to show and to demonstrate his intelligence. In some cases, he's using the animal kingdom to help him, that he actually uses his discussions with the animals to help him answer questions. We'll show you an example. Uh, it's not, again, why the Midrash connects this to this word by the bear all high, it seemed. Look, the, the translation, he discoursed about trees or he spoke on them, or he taught on them, seems to be the straightforward and the, the, the meaning of the text. But it literally can be read, he spoke to them, he spoke on them, he spoke to them. And there are people who speak to their trees, so he wouldn't be alone in speaking to the trees. Uh, most of us would not say that the trees are answering us, but he, he, is, um, he does seem to have this gift that God gave him, which is he has an intelligence, he has a wisdom that surpasses what humans normally can do. So, uh, yeah, he seems to have an ability to uh, talk with these uh, things. And, of course, what's going to be interesting about these trees is that some of these trees are gonna be used in the temple, including the cedars of Lebanon. So it helps if you know how to work with trees and know a little bit about trees or talk to the trees because he's gonna be using some of those trees for his creations. Now look what he does also. Men of all peoples came to hear Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. King Hiram of Tyre sent his officials to Solomon when he heard that he had been anointed king in place of his father, for Hiram had always been a friend of David. Right. So this is the king of Tyre in Lebanon, the Phoenicians. So it says the Phoenicians, and as we already know, they've got the cedars there. They love their cedars in Lebanon. As a matter of fact, it's on their, their flag. The tree is on the flag. They love the cedars. Yes, and it was a hospital too. Cedars of Lebanon later merged with Mount Sinai to create Cedar Sinai. But uh, it doesn't really make sense, Cedar Sinai, because the cedars were in Lebanon, not in Sinai. We had to bring them. We had to bring them to Israel. But Solomon's relationships, to some extent, it says we're here, were built on David's renown, at least when it came to the Phoenicians, at least when it came to King, King Hiram. So Hiram is going to be key to Solomon's building of the temple, because as much as Solomon is building a empire or a regional power, if not an empire, the Phoenicians have been doing this for a few years. And Hiram, well, it's very similar, which is also not surprising since the Phoenicians were Canaanite people. Mm -hmm. And they spoke Hebrew, essentially. They spoke Canaanite. So he could have talked to them without a problem. Some of the other people that are coming from the other kingdoms, well, Solomon could speak a lot of some languages, right? He could speak the languages of animals. Speaking the languages of people must have been nothing to him because he could speak animal languages and tree languages. But this is where Solomon's legend grows. It grows from his abilities uh, of his mind. And this is what makes Solomon, again, this mythological level character, which is that he is uses his mind at a level that no one else had ever done. And again, he also, though, builds on his father's relationships. So here is King Hiram trying to build up that relationship. Solomon sent this message to Hiram. You know that my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the enemies that encompassed him until the Lord had placed them under the soles of his feet. 
But now the Lord my God has given me respite all around. There is no adversary and no mischance. And so I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord promised my father David, saying, your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, shall build the house for my name. And so you can see that David, we're told by Solomon, at least in Solomon's words, is David couldn't do it. David couldn't do it because he never had enough peace to be able to do it. There's also an issue, which Solomon kind of gave away, was that God told him he wasn't going to do it. God told David, your son will do it, but you're not doing it. So David, like Moses before him, is told, you're not going to finish the job. It's a very similar kind of situation that Moses got actually in, in the portion we're about to read it, who cut in numbers. Moses is told about chapter 21, you're not coming into the land. After you strike the rock, you're not coming into the land. David is beloved by God for so many different things, but he isn't building the temple. He's not, he's not doing that. And to some extent, you get the feeling that David really wanted to do that, but he doesn't get to do it. David says essentially to God, hey, I want to build you a temple. And God says, you're not going to do it. First of all, I didn't ask you to. Second of all, you, you're not the right person for it, but your son will. So David at least has comfort that his son's going to finish, the, finish this very important task, which to some extent means that David dies never feeling like he, he was able to do the thing he really wanted to do, which is to build the temple. We don't call it the temple of, of David. We call it Solomon's so temple. Yes, there is no archaeological evidence for Solomon's temple. That is becoming not a problem to some extent because we know that because that temple was destroyed and virtually again when the second temple and then we don't call it the third temple, but the temple that King Herod built, which was virtually redoing everything that was in the second temple, redoing it, that we no, wouldn't necessarily find remnants of the temple from that. Now, that being said, we have found pieces from the second, the first temple period. So we have found stuff from that period of time. So we're, we're, we found things from about 150, 100 years after this period of time, definitively. And we found some things from this period that have not 100% been proven to be from Solomon's time, but we're pretty sure. And so it, it is very likely based on, I think, what most, not everybody, what, what most people would say archaeologic, archaeologically, that that precinct around the city of David, where the temple would have been built by Solomon, underneath where the temple was built after it was destroyed, by the Jews that came back after the Babylonian destruction, there's every, every possibility exists that that precinct was the same precinct and that it matches. What we haven't found is a definitive seal from Solomon himself. We have not found that. We have found an early reference to the house of David, which we'll talk about when we get to it, to that part of the, the Bible. But we have found a reference to David, uh, or to the house of David, not to David himself, but to the house of David, that's very, very early. But I would say, look, even well, not all scholars again, but many scholars would say that the latest that this part that we're reading was probably, was probably written was probably about 8th eighth, eighth, eighth or ninth century BC anyway. So the text itself is probably that old. But again, we don't know that for sure. So David... Couldn't do it, but Solomon is telling Hiram, I'm going to do it. Please then give orders for cedars to be cut for me in the Lebanon. My servants will work with yours and I will pay you any wages you may ask for your servants. For as you know, there is none among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. 
When Hiram heard Solomon's message, he was overjoyed. Praised be the Lord this day, he said, for granting David a wise son to govern this great people. Very nice, right? So Hiram is happy. He actually says, praised be Adonai. Baruch Adonai. That's what he says. Baruch Adonai Hayom. Praise be to God this day. And he uses the proper name for God, which is interesting because how's Hiram running around saying, not God, but Adonai, right? yud heh vav name. So Hiram seems to be very, very cool at the very least, which is why Hiram is venerated in the Freemason folk. Hiram and Solomon are partners in building the temple. And Hiram is very important in being a Gentile adherent to God, which leads people to believe that you didn't have to just be an Israelite to get it. And so Hiram is invoked a part of Masonic lore and ritual and the Bible, you know, is the basis for this, which is he gets it. He gets it. And so here's what he does. So Hiram sent word to Solomon, I have your message. I will supply all the cedar and cypress logs you require. My servants will bring them down to the sea from the Lebanon. And at the sea, I will make them into floats and deliver them to any place that you designate to me. There I shall break them up for you to carry away. You, in turn, will supply the food I require for my household. Wow. So this is quite a undertaking. And you get the idea, literally from this, what they had to do, which is that they would cut the cedars. They would cut the cedars. And then they would kill them. Which slowed them down to the ocean, to the sea, to the Mediterranean. So they used the sea to transport them because, again, these are heavy, heavy pieces of timber. And they're able to, somebody's mic is all messed up. They are able to bring this level of, of, um, of lumber. No, but you know, you, you see pictures or hear stories about what Seattle was like, you know, when they used to cut down the, the lumber in, in Portland. Yeah, they did. But what they would do as much as possible is they would send this timber down into the into the water, use the, you know, use the 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 water to kind of you know be able to transport it so that you didn't have to go through the labor of, of lifting it. Yeah. And so you can imagine them doing this with these huge pieces of cedar. And Solomon, you know, look, he's deferential to Hiram. He says, look, we don't know. We can't cut wood like that. We don't have wood like this. We, don't, we can't manufacture this kind, of, this kind of timber. But you've got it. And, and, and again, for us to be able to use this in our temple, this is what we really need. We need the best wood possible, which is your wood. And so it's beautiful that they ask, you know, that he goes through this, this, this ritual of, of negotiation with him. And, and Hiram says, look, just pay for, you know, you pay, we'll take care of it. You just pay for our food. So Hiram kept Solomon provided with all the cedar and cypress wood he required. And Solomon delivered to Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as provisions for his household and 20 cores of beaten oil. Such was Solomon's annual payment to Hiram. And that's a lot, but it's also reasonable. It's very reasonable for what he was getting in return. But again, Solomon had something that he could give to him, which was, you know, again, Phoenicia, the cities of Tyre and Sidon don't have any land. They don't have areas to, to get wheat. And maybe even Israel didn't have that much area to get wheat. But well, let's assume that they did, or they were buying wheat from Egypt or wherever they were getting it from, wherever they were getting oil Maybe from the olive trees, again, they were able to, you know, generate enough oil from within their own country. If Israel was producing it or just using it as a, you know, using their country as a transport, 
for this stuff. The reality is, is that they had something that the Phoenicians wanted. So we can see here this trade and barter that they worked on with the Phoenicians, that they were able to provide something for them in return. Is this a fair uh, uh, trade? I mean, is this a, is, who's got a good deal on this? It's difficult for us to know whether this is like, you know, this was a normal exchange, but it doesn't seem ridiculous. There's nothing in this that seems like it's not possible for the amount of wood that, that Solomon would have, would have been bringing in. Uh, but it was a major undertaking. And it also, again, shows that Israel brought in imported items to make the temple. The Lord had given Solomon wisdom as he had promised him. There was friendship between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. King Solomon imposed forced labor on all Israel. The levy came to 30,000 men. He sent them to the Lebanon in shifts of 10,000 a month. They would spend one month in the Lebanon and two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of the forced labor. Yeah, and we already heard Adoniram was in charge of the forced labor, but now we heard specifically what they were doing. Now, what's interesting about this, of course, is that they're doing forced labor outside of Israel. So for a month, they would go up. So if they did three shifts of 10,000 men at a time, they were sending up 10,000 men for a month at a time up to Lebanon. That's a lot of people. That's an enormous amount of people. Uh, again, they're also not working in Israel, but they are working, you can make the argument, to create the temple. Were they enjoying this work? Again, it's the mas. That's the word that we have here. This is the mas. So they would spend one month in Lebanon and two months back in Israel. So that's three months. So again, it's about... 25% tax rate, if you look at it that way. But of course, people probably didn't like being away from home because there was travel time. There was also this issue where if I have to get back for an emergency, I'm not getting back for an emergency. If my kids, if I have a kid being born, if one of my kids or my wife needs me, you're not getting back. You're not, go, you're not leaving Lebanon to run home. So this was not probably a fun thing for people to do. But again, look, if they needed these many people, it was a huge undertaking. But it, no matter what, it seems as this was a huge undertaking. Bringing these people up to Lebanon to bring down this wood and, and putting them to work, bringing them back into Israel, bringing this wood back into Israel, it's a huge amount of work. How long did this go on for? Solomon also had 70,000 porters and 80,000 quarriers in the hills. Apart from Solomon's 3,300 officials who were in charge of the work and supervised the gangs doing the work. The king ordered huge blocks of choice stone to be quarried so that the foundations of the house might be laid with hewn stones. Wow, okay, so now we get into the quarry work that's being done. Now that seems like, again, almost a ridiculous amount of workers, uh, of, of uh, quarriers, you know, of, of rock cutters. So if they were sending 30,000 people a year up into Lebanon to cut rock, they're getting 80,000 people to cut stone. Again, <laughs> it just seems a little bit higher than what, um, would seem able be able to be done. Uh, it's a, just it would have been a tremendous undertaking. But look, it, it, did it take ten thousand people? Maybe. But the Bible tells us that Solomon conscripted his own people. Our ancestors were conscripted to build the temple, which means that they did it whether they wanted to or not. This isn't like a bunch of volunteers got together to, to do a barn raising. These are people who are 
I think you're supposed to walk away from this going, this was hard work. Working in a quarry, cutting rock is hard work, especially if that's not what your job is normally. If you're normally a farmer or you're, you're, a, you're, you're taking care of your past, you know, you're, you're, you're pastoring your flocks, you know, you're taking your shepherd, I guess. It's the word I'd be looking for. Shepherd, a herdsman, that, that maybe you're driving a caravan. This is not your normal job. And so this is probably not an easy thing to do. It was probably not something that people were well equipped to do, but now they have to do it. Now, didn't they say that the Solomon's temple was a lot bigger than the second temple? So Solomon's temple, we're going to get to the description of Solomon's temple. <laughs> it's bigger than the second temple. But is it bigger than the temple that the is it bigger than the temple that King Herod builds? That's a difficult thing to, to imagine, uh, though it is possible. Because remember, King Herod builds the temple 1,000 years later after Solomon. 1,000 years later. Now, again, there weren't major technological advances over that, that year, those years, but a thousand years is still a thousand years. It still reflects lots more people. It does reflect a little bit of technological advances. I mean, you're talking about a thousand, during the time of King Solomon, we've, we've mentioned this before, Greece, they're like cavemen in Greece at this point. There's no Greek culture like we think of later on. This is not, the, the, you have Egypt and you have Babylonia, and that's about it at this period. I don't mean China, India, all those other places we talk about that had cultures early on, you're talking about really only Egypt and, and, and Babylonia. And, and, and they knew that. Everybody knew it. And whatever Solomon did, does here, to some extent, he's doing something to put Israel on a, on a level with other people, which is probably what King Herod did too, which is what every, you know, crazy dude who wants to build the biggest skyscraper in the world wants to do today. You just say, my country is the most important. Which is why the Emirates are building big buildings. You know, they got to build the biggest building. They got to build the biggest, they got to build the biggest Ferris wheel, whatever, you know, you got to build a Ferris wheel five feet higher than the last Ferris. I mean, this is crazy stuff, but that's what people did. And Solomon, whatever Solomon did, he tried to do something in building the temple that's going to send a message, which is that our kingdom is for real. And so he, he's, he's got to press people into service to do this. He's going to, it's going to take a lot of people. Whether it took 3,300 officials, that's just people who are counting stuff on a piece of paper. Well, that's, we're going to get, yeah, we're going to get to it. And, it, and it, he does it over a short period of time, so he needs more people. But this does seem like just an enormous amount of people. That are under that that are going through this. I mean, eighty thousand couriers just seems like it just doesn't seem like. I understand, but eighty thousand just the equipment to 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 put eighty thousand eighty thousand chisels in people's hands is almost like uh, almost impossible. It's almost impossible to consider even in over the course of a year. So it's a, it's a tremendous amount. Like if everybody chiseled out, you know, five or six bricks, it's still, it's still a lot. I mean, that would be 400,000, you know, pieces of, of stone. This is, I, I, again, is it possible? Yeah, but it's a lot. That's a lot of people. So again, this is why the Midrash builds on this because it is, uh, and we'll look at, Reverend Lynn was asking when we're looking, we'll look at the Midrash, especially when it comes to, the uh, the uh, the way he builds this, or what he uses, or how he uses this, we'll, we'll take a look at it next week. Um, actually, we're almost done with this chapter, but we're going to read a little bit more because I, I do want you to read. I do want you to read. Um, I wanted to read one one passage here. So uh, let's finish this up. Solomon's masons, Hiram's masons, and the men of Gebal shaped them. Thus, the timber and the stones for building the house were made ready. Yep. So, they call it the house. They call it the house, the bite. 
Livnot Habayit. And we call it the Beit Hamikdash, right? The Holy Temple. Right. But it literally means the house of holiness. That's what it means. The house of the holy. So here's what it says. In the 480th year after the Israelites left the land of Egypt, in the month of Z, that is the second month, in the fourth year of his reign over Israel, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord. The house which King Solomon built for the Lord was 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. And so if you think about what the dimensions of that are like, it's not ridiculously big, which is, which is why when you, think about, when you think about how much rock would be quarried, it doesn't seem like it, it wouldn't take that many people because essentially it's 100 feet by 30 feet, but it's quite high. So by, by our standards, by our, by our vision, putting together um, 30 cubits, which is about 40, 45 feet high, doesn't seem ridiculously high. But that's three stories, four stories. That's a very tall building in the ancient world. Uh, 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 how does it compare to the temp to uh, the tabernacle? So there's a good question about whether the tabernacle's dimensions would have fit inside this very building. And this is what uh, Richard Friedman's argument is, and who wrote the Bible, is that depending on the way you put the um, you know the 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 way that you lay out the poles for the the uh, tabernacle. If you put them um, kind of interlocking or, or kind of like um, if you have the, if you have the, the, um, the poles or the, the foot, the, the fittings for the, for the, um, for the sides of the walls kind of uh, um, not interlocking, but overlapping. Staggered. Yeah, if they're overlapping, then it's possible that the tabernacle would have actually fit within this building. Otherwise, the tabernacle is actually a little longer than this. So, so there's there's a question of whether you know he argues that it probably at least could have fit inside it. Um, and again, you know, it's it's a it would have been a a, a very large structure in those days. And, and again, you know, we, we were talking about whether these figures are, are, are somewhat exaggerated. This doesn't seem to be exaggerated. This is not by the standards of what a, the tabernacle. Yes, this is the permanent structure. So that's why Friedman argues that they would have wanted to put the tabernacle inside of it, or at least have a representation of it inside the, inside of it. The, the the at the very least you wouldn't want it to be smaller, right? And so there's a there is a sense that maybe there there was a representation of it inside of it, namely by the fact that the cruvim that were inside of him, the cherubim, would have been roughly kind of where you could have put the the tabernacle underneath it. But we'll we'll take a look at that on next week. But but this is what his dimensions are. The portico in front of the great hall of the house was 20 cubits long along the width of the house and 10 cubits deep to the front of the house. He made windows for the house, recessed and latticed. Against the outside wall of the house, the outside walls of the house enclosing the great hall and the shrine, he built a storage structure and he made side chambers all around. The lowest story was five cubits wide the middle one six cubits wide, and the third seven cubits wide. For he had provided recesses around the outside of the house so as not to penetrate the walls of the house. So what, he, what we're talking about here, of course, is the outside of the, of the, of the, well, at least the superficial outside of the temple, which is what people would have seen. Now look, as much as there was an inner space for the priests there's also the outer space which people see and he and what what they're saying is that there was a lot of construction that went into the outer the outer part and we'll all i'll put up a picture in a second of, of 
you know, some of the feelings of what this looked like. But one of the things that you got to remember about, about the descriptions here are, these are the only dimensions that we have in the Bible about how big this was. And it reminds us of things that we've already seen, like the tabernacle. <coughs> For that matter, like the ark that Noah built. You know, when we see these kinds of dimensions, you know, immediately we're, we, you know, the, I think the first thing that we do, say immediately, is to try to figure out, do these dimensions make sense? Do they, do they logically, can they be something that would, would be able to stand, you know, are they, are they architecturally sound, right? Um, and so I think that's part of like the first thing that people do is they try to figure out whether, you know, that, that's a, you know, that's a, um, uh, a viable, is it a viable construction? Um, I will show you one picture here, which is, um, let me just show you this one. Um, so, let me just get this one right up here. Um, what I, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you two different pictures, um, kind of an exterior shot and then an interior shot. And again, you, you know, you can find these on the internet. You know, there's, there's different places where you can look at them. There's some are a little bit more artistic and some are, are more real. I will not say realistic, but based on, you know, what we know about, um, you know, what we know about, um, ancient architecture and taking, you know, taking those things into consideration. So let me, let me just show um, a couple of them. So this one is more of an exterior shot. Um, this is an exterior shot of what it would have looked like. So, so we have the, the main building here, which is, you know, the, well, one we said was about 100 by three, by 30, sorry. So it's, a, it's about a, you know, three times deeper, longer than it is wider, which is why you see that. And you see the windows on it. And then you can see the side buildings, these, these story buildings that are on the sides. And then you have the portico, you have the entrance in the front. And then the... That's not the Holy Holy Ghost, right? No, no. This is the altar, though, the big altar that would have been built. That would have been again from the outside, and then you can see the laver. By the way, to the 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 big laver, which would have had water in it, and then this gives you the bisection. You know what it looked like inside. The the uh, part of it looks like the Mormon temple. Oh yeah, well that's because they. Right. They looked at the Especially Bible. Especially the what they would call a baptismal font. Yeah. And the thing that's interesting about it is to, is uh, when you think about the, the dimensions and the way it was designed, the Mormons also relied heavily on Freemasonry. And so I, I the Freemasons, you know, were very connected to these descriptions as well. But um, what what would have probably happened is that People um, in Freemasonry, you know, over the years had developed um, in these traditions, which the Mormons borrowed from. But they also, of course, went back to the original text and looked at what the text itself, you know, described, and especially the lavers and these kinds of things, the, the, you know, the big bowl. But this is the Holy of Holies back here. And so you have the Kruvim here. And so the question is, is underneath here, within these dimensions, would the Ark, where the Ark is done here, and the ark, remember the Ark has Kruvim on top of it. It has right. the angel beams on top. But would, would, would there have been like a tent that could have been represented, the inner tent, the uh, Ohel Moed, would that have been underneath here? Uh, Friedman seems to think it would. Again, was this a representation of the, the dimensions of the tabernacle, which was also much longer than it was uh, wide? It was not a square, 
it was a it was a rectangle you know does this does this kind of give us those dimensions and kind of give us a sense of of uh of that what what i like about this design here too is that you see that there was this great laver this this one that had the the bowls the brass uh, these bowls here um and then you also have these other lavers that it talks about that were also pretty sizable but this one here i mean this one here might have not have been architecturally sound by the way um uh, but these ones yeah that, that water is awfully heavy yeah this th these are much more within the realm of what people could do uh, but this might not have been possible just based on the weight of the water that would have been inside that which would have been like you know tons oh. of water so um you know, look, was it always filled? Was it always, you know, did it have water in it? Was more, was it more of a, of a representation, you know, there for ornamental purposes or functional purposes? But yes, all of these things were supposed to be awe-inspiring. And it's why we turned to the, uh, to the great builders that existed in, um, in uh, Phoenicia for, for, um, for guidance. What we know is the Phoenicians and the Canaanites did build temples because we found them. And what's interesting about the temples that we found, including the ones in, in Lebanon, but also the ones that we found even within the boundaries of Israel, we found holy precincts, holy temples. They are very often, and in Syria too, which are all Canaanite you know, areas, they are all on similar layouts. They are all on similar dimensions to this temple, which are these kind of elongated rectangles, rectangulars, uh, you know, structures with a with a uh, altar in front of it. Uh, and, and next week, we'll look at it a little bit more. And we'll look at a little bit of the Midrash. Because um, for the rabbis, and again, you looked at the construction, it, it's pretty enormous. So it's, it definitely is a huge project for the ancient world. The rabbis imagined that it wasn't just people that worked on these things. But literally, angels and demons were harnessed in order to um, in order to get the uh, get this stuff built. I will tell you next week too. One of we're going to read one of the one of my favorite, and it's literally just a couple of verses uh, after he builds the house. Um, we'll get into the inner the the inner stuff, uh, the decorations. Um, is that? Uh, I'll get to it right here. Um, I want you because I want to give you a little taste of what we'll read next week. Um, hold it, hold it, hold it. Yeah, look at this. this is all next week is all going to be the temple. Um, I will show you. Um, hold it. Uh, it's all temple. Wow. I forgot how long it is. It's uh -huh. longer that we're not going to get through all that. <laughs> There's no way we're getting through all this. So uh, it'll take a couple of weeks. But um, I will tell you that uh, that this is, um, wow, I forgot how long it is. This is going on. Well, I will say this. If you look at this, this is a super, super long chapter. This is chapter eight. And that is uh, chapter eight. Yeah, this is all chapter eight. It's a very long chapter, super long chapter. Um, chapter seven and eight next week. And yeah, that's probably what we'll be reading next week is all the cre uh, all the, uh, the building of the temple. Um, I will tell you this. Um, this is most of what we know about King Solomon. Um, uh, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> We're not getting to it next week, but we'll get to it soon. The Queen of Sheba. Uh, but as you can see, a huge part of, of Solomon's uh, uh, text is about building the temple, uh, which what we know about Solomon. Uh, the other stuff we have is legend around 
you know, his ability to talk to the animals, to write things, to, uh, to be married to lots of women. But really what we know about most from the book of Kings, from the Bible, from the, not from the Midrash, but from the Bible, is the a construction of the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. So we will be reading that next week. We will be virtual. And again, thank you everybody for being with us for this. Rosemary, thank you for, thank you. Uh, for reading. And we hope to see everybody next week. Take care. And we'll be here tomorrow right. for Exodus. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.